Welcome back to the channel, guys. We are so glad that you're here today and you joined us today. Today's gonna to be a really exciting video. We came across an unschooling adult interview, um, a grown-up, if you will, unschooler that did this interview, and I thought it was so impactful and so well done. I just couldn't wait to share it with y'all. So we are going to be sitting down today, me, Texas mom, if you're new to the channel, I'm Texas mom, and and this is my son, Matt, and Matt is 17 years old now. And I just thought this would be a really great opportunity to just kind of react to this video and mm -hmm. share our thoughts with you and some of our philosophy of homeschool and unschool and, and why that all works for our family. I quit school when I was eight years old and have never looked back since. <laughs> this is Sierra Allen. And you might have a hard time making sense of her story at first, because most people think you're not supposed to quit school as a third grader, let alone look back after 20 years and still see that as the right decision. But this isn't the story of some rebellious eight-year-old who just made a terrible choice but managed to turn out okay in spite of it all. No, there's actually a broader philosophy behind Sierra's approach to learning. And I want to show you my conversation with Sierra as a way of introducing you to this way of thinking that took what could have been a disastrous choice for Sierra and turned it into a decision that she stands by to this day. You see, Sierra is not a dropout. She's an unschooler. Now you might be wondering, what is unschooling? Unschooling is this idea of like kind of taking ownership over your own path of learning and really making your own choices and decisions when it comes to your own education. So this idea of unschooling, you might be new to this idea. We are not new to this idea and this no. concept. And this is an idea that can be as different and can vary so much from family to family. It can look extremely different because it is a child-led or delight-driven, there's lots of names for it, type of education, yep. approach to education that is so far outside of the box of normal, um, what we think in our American or most countries here, I know we have a lot of Aussies that follow us as well, um, our concept of modern day education is, is very um, constrained to this very tight little box. And when you look at the philosophy of unschool, you really have to break down a lot of those barriers in your own mind. And I know for us, um, early on um, with homeschooling, um, not too far into it, I really had to, um, for our own success in homeschooling, mm -hmm. I really had to start to break down some of those barriers that I had set up in my own mind. And one of my famous mom quotes of all times is, you are the boss of your books, you yep. are the boss of your homeschool. And I firmly believe that, I believe it to this day, I've always said it, my children have full responsibility for their own educations. Um, I am just here as a help I'm here as a facilitator, I'm here as a cheerleader and encourager um, to help them and give them information as they move along and yeah. as they self-educate um, throughout their lives. That does not necessarily mean that it ends at 17 years no. old. <laughs> we all continue to grow and gain knowledge and education throughout our lives. But <laughs> I was a big proponent in you're the boss of your books, you're the boss of your homeschool. And that takes a lot of the responsibility off of the parent and puts it on to the child. So now they have ownership of their learning experience and they get to drive the ship and that is a whole lot more fun, I can tell you. Yeah, and that's the other thing too. It's definitely at, at first, if you're coming from uh, somebody's perspective of uh, sending your kids to public school, um, this whole thing of take them out of that and then absolutely just let them do whatever they want to do is definitely very drastic. I, I get that. Um, and also this whole video, we are talking to the bell curve. We're not talking to either ends of the extremes because there sure. are crazy extremes on both ends, we're not talking to those people, we we're talking to the majority of people. That might sound pretty bold to let young kids be completely in charge of their own education. Like, who's gonna teach them? 
Unschooling can be a tough thing to wrap your head around, but one of the first things to understand about unschoolers is that they think learning doesn't require teaching. And so, they tend to see school as we know it as largely unnecessary. What does learning look like when it's not the result of teaching? I mean, it looks like life. <laughs> Just like doing what you want and finding out that you need to learn something to, to get to where you want and then figuring out ways of doing that. Think about how adults learn after we leave school. Now, sometimes it does resemble the formal study we did when we were students, but mostly we just live life, strive for things, make mistakes, and learn from experience. That's like a lot of the kids that are in public school and everything like that. They're in such an artificial environment with learning whatever they are learning in public school nowadays. And then once they do graduate and they get thrown into the real world, they have no idea what the heck to do. Um, most of them are broke, so then they're still living in their parents' house, and they're kind of in a broken family, or not even in a broken family, just a normal family, and their parents are just like, okay, buddy, it's your life, go, you know, go make it. Um, so then they're going to scramble, they're going to go and try to find some cog in the machine job just to make ends meet, and just to pay bills and stuff like that, and to be able to buy their own stuff. Um, and then kind of like y'all, because y'all mm -hmm. been through it all. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely say there was probably a couple years of just trying to figure out what Absolutely. in the world you were going to do. Absolutely. You know? I mean, we did not have even the social skills. It's funny, a lot of people like to talk about social skills, right, as mm -hmm. related to homeschooling. Um, and How are they going to socialize How with would you possibly socialize and interact with your world if you were free to live in your world every day and you weren't confined to this artificial artificial environment of a school atmosphere whether that be whatever private school christian school public school charter school this artificial synthetic environment and of course there is a time and place for yes. um a um, structured mm -hmm. type style of learning when yes. you're studying to be a certain um, yes. vocation. They're going to get into that in the video as well. Right, so there will be absolutely a time and place yes. for um, studying to um, approach a certain type of profession yeah, or exactly. vocation or things like that. But that's not, again, what we're talking about. We're talking about just generalizations in um, general. Um, and I just think that Socially, you're so much more equipped to just transition fluidlessly, like, I don't know, fluidly mm -hmm. into society if yeah. you have already been engaging in your society for yeah. this whole entire time, full time, not I'm in school for eight hours a day no. and then I do homework for two hours a day and then I go to soccer camp for an hour and then I get a bath and go to bed and do it all over again and that's what I do five days a week and then in the summer I'm in all these programs and camps and then, you know, I went to college. And I mean, how many socially awkward kids did we all know oh in God. college? I mean, there's a lot of socially um, awkward, not people that don't um, process well and deal well in public settings just because they've been programmed and conditioned to be in um, a more controlled synthetic environment their whole entire lives. So I can see that difference with our children. Our children are first generation homeschoolers, or if you want to call them unschoolers, we don't yes. really care the label that you put on them, but they have been engaging in their communities um, from the time that they were really little. We were always everywhere. We were in the hardware stores. We were in the grocery stores. Yeah. We were at the parks. We were on the beach, we were on the boardwalks, we were everywhere yeah. uh, on vacations together yeah. as families, um, just uh, all always engaged in our uh, uh, church, in yeah. our neighborhoods, uh, just everywhere. We're, it's just a second nature thing to be engaged. Yeah, and if a neighbor, you know, we had a new neighbor show up, he pulled up in the front of our house. And uh, we didn't feel uh, socially awkward or anything like, oh, we, you know, like, what should we do or anything? We just walked on up there and talked to him like he's, you know, just 
you know, he's your neighbor or right. whatever or any. I, I think that's a thing guy. too, right? Yeah. Too is that you're not intimidated by no. interacting with adults nope. or older people, or it's just like there is no age, no dis, um, discrepancy yeah. there. It's just like you you just have the same level of respect for your parents as you do the adults at the hardware yep. store or whoever. It's just like that. And it seems like since you've gotten your license, your driver's license, mm -hmm. and um, that level of independence and interaction in your world has just like been through the roof. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're just engaged in town all yeah. the time. Yeah, absolutely. So why can't kids learn the same way? Well, according to unschoolers, they can and they can figure out what's important to learn just by being good observers of the world around them. Maybe kids don't even need to go to school in order to learn how to learn. Now, this might be easier to take in if you're willing to expand your idea of what counts as learning. I also really think that learning happens through relationship and, and not just relationship with other humans, but also relationship with your environment, with your hobby, with your passion, with your dog, with your neighbor. I see learning as this kind of like beautiful, even like maybe sacred concept, kind of like how, you know, like laughter is like this special, like human thing, right? There's these things in life that are just like magical. And I think learning is one of those things. You can't put it in a box and it just like shows up. And sometimes you don't even realize you're learning. I think it's almost a mistake to name it because then we like, put it, we put it in a box, right? We think like, oh, learn, I'm learning now. I'm not learning now. But if you're alive, you're learning. If you care. About exactly. So if you're alive, you're learning. So it's like, um, you know, when people are like, oh, when are you going to graduate or whatever? Um, I don't really see graduating and then being like, okay, I'm all done my learning now. So now I can go get a job or whatever. I'm going to be perpetually learning and trying, having people that are coming from, you know, it's trickier when you are, I would say, to homeschool or unschool if it's only, which I am talking about the bell curve, but to one extreme though too, it is nice that all of us kids have each other um, for friends. So it would definitely be trickier if you only had um, a, like a single child or something like that. Um, it would be different for them to get out there more and put themselves out there and everything like that in the community. But it still is totally possible. If you care about stuff and if you're in relationship with stuff, you're learning. Yeah, that sounds nice and all, but can this actually work? Like, can academic skills emerge from such a loosey-goosey approach? Take reading, for instance. Teachers spend years honing the craft of teaching how to read. Can we really count on it just happening spontaneously? To take reading, for example, like, I didn't really know this. I learned to read super young. Um, my parents just like read to me when I was like four and then I learned. But I have friends who were unschooled whose parents never, you know, sat down and taught them how to read, ever. And some of them didn't learn how to read until like they were 12. 12 years old. Yeah. Let's pause here. I want you to take a moment to imagine a 12 year old who doesn't know how to read. Normally in a school context, this is a bad sign. We could pretty safely say that such a student probably has a bad attitude about reading. Maybe they have some kind of processing difficulty, but certainly they're way behind and it's going to be really difficult to catch up at this point. And it's very likely to be bad news for the rest of their academic development going forward. But in an unschooling context, the way they describe like learning how to read was just kind of having no interest in it. One day, like picking up a book like about horses and they were into horses, right? And then being like, okay, I'm just gonna read this book because I really wanna read this book. And then within like an hour or two hours, like learning how to read. And, and for me, I was like, wait, 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 that, that's possible? <laughs> I think that would shock a lot of people. Right. You're saying people just start reading at 12 and it According works. to them. According to them, yes. <laughs> so I looked for other accounts of this happening, unschoolers learning to read way later than what's considered normal in school. And these stories are a little hard to find, but they do exist. Now, it doesn't usually take two hours. From what I've seen, something like two months sounds more typical, but still, two months. Like, this seems to be a real thing that away from the pressures and the guilt and the pathologizing of school, Older kids can reach so-called grade level reading skills and beyond remarkably quickly, all without being explicitly taught. Yeah, but I mean, it also makes sense. It's like, 
when you really have a desire and like a need to learn something, whatever it is in your life, um, and you're you, it, it's coming from you, then you know there may be even steps that you you need to take in order to get there, like sort of incremental steps. But you're gonna exactly. So like whenever we have to learn something new. Normally, it's either business related um, or skill related, whatever that might be, from running a chainsaw to running a sawmill to running a tractor, mm -hmm. driving a car. When you are presented with something and you actually want to learn it, I think your brain works so much better than being like, you need to learn how to read or you need to learn to do this, that, and the other yeah. right now. Yeah. And if you don't, then you know you're an idiot so you just better go ahead and start learning it right now and i just don't think you know it'd be like if somebody came up to me and was like you have to learn whatever plumbing or something right now here just start doing your lessons right now okay i might learn how to do plumbing but i'm not going to excel in learning how to plumb but if i have like a leaky drain or something or i need to go plumb a house or something like that I'm going to learn as much as I can because I want to know all the ins and outs of plumbing. And I will learn it 10 times faster because my brain's actually turned on and I'm wanting to soak up as much knowledge as possible. Right. And I can say from a mom's perspective of homeschooling now, like I shared in another video for about 20 years, we actually homeschooled another child before Matt for about five years. I have about 20 years of homeschool now under my belt, so I think I can speak from a little bit of experience that there have been times um, where I stopped or took breaks mm -hmm. with um, the traditional type homeschooling of a workbook or whatever um, class or thing that we were working on, I would just stop, whether it was an online thing or whatever we were doing, stop and take a total break for that child. If they kind of hit a, a wall with learning um, in the traditional sense, uh, talking about academic learning, yeah. I would just say, okay, we're just going to stop. We're just going to take a break for a few months. And sometimes if you took like, I know this sounds crazy, yeah. but if you took like a three month break or a six month break, and then you come back to um, doing something and reintroducing something back to your child again, just in that break and in that freedom from that break, I don't know how many times I came to my husband and said, I don't know, I don't understand it, but they have like soared. Like they've done so much better now and we haven't been doing anything like yeah. but we have been doing things we've yes. been we've been engaged in life the pressures of this technical type schooling yeah. was off and their brains were able to relax and just engage in the world around them and they had time to mature maturity is a huge thing for kids if you give especially little kids they're maturing at such a quick rate that three months or six months um, in a time mm -hmm. of a little child's life, you're going to see drastic changes in maturity level. Or maybe you won't. Maybe they're late bloomers and maybe they're not going to learn or be interested in learning yeah. to read in the sense that you think they should be learning to read according to the confines and made up definitions of Americana today. Yes. Um, until they're 12, maybe that's when they're going to be interested. And that is totally fine. This, this whole idea of um, school and the school system and philosophy of what is now um, education, what is now defined as the only way to educate human beings um, in first world countries is is very, very recent history. And I can go back and give you so many um, things, books um, and resources to dive into that. And this is backed up by science, guys. This is backed up by research. This is backed up by educators. Um, I can list some um, really awesome books for you in the description below to just back up all the things that I'm saying. But that is my one point is that when you are given the break, um, yeah. I've seen the evidence in that, that they 
have soared and flourished and I, I couldn't ever line that up in my mind because of my own bias coming into the homeschool world. Um, so we have a family member who is, that is a full spectrum autistic, a full, fully, fully autistic. He is verbal, but that is very limited and he was nonverbal for many, many years. And um, his mother did an unschooling approach with all of her children within her homeschool. And um, a couple of their children are extremely intelligent and they just soared and went on to do all kinds of amazing things and and still do amazing things um, and it wasn't in the confines or constructs of any type of um, curriculum or anything like that it was all just interest-led child-led learning and um, and good parenting which is a good combination there and then um, their autistic child um, he taught himself how to read. He can read, he can write, he enjoys reading. Um, he still doesn't have good interaction with the world around him really, um, but he is um, emotionally, he can interact with you as far as um, giving you a hug and those kinds of things and show emotions, which is really um, great, but he, but he can read. And, and she used to say, I have no idea how he taught himself how to read. I've tried to teach him like letters and sounds and things like that. And it's just, it was just not going to happen, but he taught himself how to read. So even in a limited um, capacity, someone who is dealing with a more limited capacity in regards to academia, um, this is totally possible. The human brain is totally capable of learning what you want to learn if there is a will and desire yeah. to learn. But you're going to figure that out, you know, if you, if you want the thing enough, you know what I mean? So I think that is like a huge misconception about learning. And I think learning can happen in so many different ways that I think we're just starting to be open to because we've had this sort of fixed mindset around like what it looks like for so long, right? Now you might say, what if somebody doesn't want to learn to read? The short answer is that unschoolers tend to believe that school itself is the reason many kids don't like reading. But we'll revisit a broader version of that question later. For now, let's move away from talking about this in the abstract and start getting concrete. Let's dive into the specifics of what leaving school was like for Sierra. So once you left, what was it like on a day-to-day -day basis? So I went through a lot of different phases and tried a lot of different things. Um, the first two years were what you might call like de-schooling. Real quick, de-schooling is not just another word for unschooling. In unschooling circles, it specifically refers to the period of time after leaving conventional school where it's expected that children will need time to decompress and release the pressures and the negative associations built up from years of school. So actually like no curriculum, no workbooks, no like formal sit down and learn a thing. It was um, stay at home with my dad. My dad was building a house at the time, learning like construction and like helping out with that, like running around in the woods, like identifying mushrooms. I was like super into that at that time. And like playing, like going to the library and reading tons of books and just like kind of do, like playing and doing what I wanted. Um, so that was the first two years. After that, um, there was sort of more, I guess, more pressure to ke like keep up with every like everyone else my age in terms of like academics, right? And so I did end up um, doing like a correspondence program for some for some number of years, where I just had like a remote teacher, and he would send me like stuff, and I would send back, um, and that was good. I enjoyed it. It didn't take a lot of my time, and it was fun. I really I really liked that teacher. And I had all the flexibility that I wanted, you know, it was just a matter of like taking some time during the day and doing the schoolwork. Um, and then after that, in like my high school years, I had did a similar thing, although without a teacher, it was just a kind of a, a curriculum that I like uploaded onto my computer. The internet wasn't so, so useful back then. Um, and so I, I just worked through that kind of on my like downtime, basically. So it was like, probably took up about 10 or 15 percent of my time um, doing schoolwork and then the rest of my time I could travel, I could start a business, I could play, I could cl rock climb, I could do whatever I wanted. Did you catch that? She said academic work took about 10 to 15 percent of her time. So yeah, that's the other cool thing about 
either loose homeschooling or unschooling. Um, I think we're more on the looser side of homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely a stricter world of homeschooling. That is one of the things, you know, we, we get questions all the time from people and they're like, so how long does it normally take y'all to do schoolwork? We're like an hour, maybe two max to the sky. Um, and they're like, they kind of look at you like, what in the world? Like then what he's going to go on and talk about kind of is like, are you leaving stuff out or whatever? And that's, you know, we're not leaving anything out. Yeah. Now, I mean, I can say this, that definitely there was a, a phase for me and a little bit for my husband. My husband um, has a different personality than me and he's way more laid back. And I think he embraced this whole idea of unschooling or child-led learning from right from the start, yeah. I would say. My brain needed some time to kind of decompress from all of the years of public school and then um, four years of college, my brain had really um, wrapped my mind around and being exposed to Christian school. Um, I, I was really not able to see, I feel like I had blinders on my eyes to only be able to see education in this certain mm. way. And I don't think even though we were relaxed homeschoolers, it really didn't happen totally for us that we've kind of um, transitioned more into this unschooling, if you will, lifestyle until we moved down here yeah. and then um, I got pregnant with um, our fourth child. And I remember being on this living room floor with three older children and trying to teach them all out of workbooks and just pulling my hair out and having a baby on my lap and nursing a baby and and then coming to the end of that school year and we finished all of the workbooks and then I asked them some questions and I, and I found out that we had just finished workbooks but they hadn't really absorbed the information that we had like tortured ourselves with learning that whole entire year and I just thought all I'm doing is filling out workbooks like th these these aren't things that are being absorbed at this point and maybe it is the the method that wasn't right or the timing that wasn't right i'm not sure or the interest wasn't there but i just was really at a crossroads and some a friend of mine um well at that point we had met up with a relaxed homeschooling group and she said take those workbooks and lock them away put them away and i'll tell you what it was the hardest thing as a homeschool mom that was the hardest decision i had ever had to make that was so hard because in my mind i was so thinking that mm -hmm. you have to finish this amount of work in a certain year and and you or you'll fall behind i mean oh my goodness you wouldn't ever want to fall behind and then you know a friend of mine said fall behind who who are you falling behind and mm -hmm. who are you and who's to say they're behind? Yeah. I mean, I see what they're doing and they're here on this farm and they're in this environment that they're flourishing. They're they're learning all of these life skills and and just doing these amazing things and they were. But when I sat down to do an hour or maybe an hour and a half or 2 hours worth of schoolwork and we tortured ourselves, um, I, I just really had a hard time making those um, mm -hmm. things line up in my mind. And I locked those workbooks away. And I think that was probably the happiest day of my children's lives when the workbooks all got locked away. I still have them, by the way. They're all still in my cabinet. Still locked up. Still locked away. We have not pulled them back out ever since. And, um, and we've done lots of different things since. Mm -hmm. We've done online programs. We've done totally uh, unschool approach for uh, several years yeah. um, where I just said, give me a page of something written. You can copy it. You can write whatever you want. You can just give me one page of something written a day. I mean, we've done just interest led, you know, or you tell me and I'll write it down for you or tell me what you're excited about today and I'm going to write it down and then you go do it. And I, I just can't tell you, I mean, all of the things that you see our children doing. And I'll tell you that what you see our children doing on screen, on YouTube or Instagram is only maybe an eighth 
of yeah. what they actually do and maybe an eighth of the skills that they actually have. And I'm not boasting. I'm just saying that in a very just realistic yeah. wa- way. Um, they have skills that have far surpassed me and my husband. They're not skills that we taught them. They were just um, things that they have learned truly just by interest and and just having the self-confidence to just pursue it and fail and do it and get it right and succeed. And and we, we just couldn't be more pleased. Yeah. And that came with locking away the curriculum and giving them the freedom to pursue their interests. Yep. And that felt low to me. I used to be a teacher and a really common feeling among teachers is that there's so much curriculum to get through and so little time to cover it all. So I was curious. Were you leaving a bunch of stuff out or is it somehow more efficient to do it on your own? For me, it was just like easy and efficient to do it on my own because it was like, I, I clearly, I was doing it because I wanted to. So it was like, I wasn't, you know, procrastinating. I just like sat down and did it. Honestly, I feel like in school, of course, I haven't been in school in a super long time, so maybe things have changed. <laughs> I've not been in a school in a really long time, but it just seemed to me like the the small bits that I that I was in school, it was like the the curriculum for the next year is basically the same thing as the last year with like some more details like added in. There's something you said earlier. You learned the academic things because you wanted to. Do you think you were able to unschool because you happen to have this desire to do academic work and maybe there's other types of kids who don't want to do it and so unschooling wouldn't work for them? What do you think about that? Mm, Great question. So I think that, yeah, I think that there are people out there who are less inclined to doing academic work than than probably I was as a kid. Um, And that doesn't mean that unschooling isn't for them because I actually going like if I if I like look back and think about okay I'm 10 years old again I just quit school um like what would would I do anything differently and I think that if I'd thrown out the entire idea of like keeping up with my schoolwork and sort of following a curriculum I think I would have been just fine like I don't I don't think that was sort of like an essential part of my education Um, and I think for folks who, yeah, who decide to to unschool and who don't have any sort of academic leanings that way in a specific way, um, I think they're going to learn what they need to learn to do what they want to do regardless. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Um, do you think any, anything needs to be mandatory? Does any class need to be mandatory? Do we need to make sure every kid learns a certain set of things or should everything be optional? Everything. Everything should be optional. I think if anything is not optional, then you have a course of system that then is actually unhealthy. That might have taken you off guard, but it's a sentiment I've heard before in the unschooling world. The idea goes something like this. One of the fundamental problems with school as we know it is that it's compulsory. It's mandatory. It's non-consensual. And not only is that ethically questionable, but the tension involved often gets in the way of learning. Remember, unschoolers tend to believe that children don't need to be taught how to learn and that they're capable of deciding for themselves what's important to learn just by observing the world around them. So if that's your starting point and you look around and you see all these adults trying to intervene in that process and call the shots, even if those adults are acting out of concern and compassion, then to you, maybe it just seems patronizing. Are you saying that the act of saying children must learn this and we have to make them learn it, whether they want to or not, is an act of mistrust and disrespect and it's it's inhumane? I do. And I realize that that's like a pretty strong like stance. What I'm talking about is not the people. It's not it's not it's not the teachers. It's not the not even the administrators. I, I think that everyone at all levels are a victim of this 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 system. It's really not even a system. It's a mindset. It's a culture around um, like how we think we need to treat people for them to become good citizens or good human beings. The mindset and culture that Sierra is talking about might sound kind of strange to you. So let me see if I can make it clearer with an analogy. Throughout much of history, Corporal punishment was super common. 
It's still pretty common in some places, but it used to be so normalized that people thought it was necessary. Like, you need to paddle your child when they misbehave, otherwise they will grow up to be a criminal. And if they do end up being a criminal, then we need to give them a good flogging in the town square. This stuff really wasn't criticized for a long time. And even today, you see parenting advice that's not so much you shouldn't spank your child as much as it is you need to spank your child the right way. Similarly, almost all of the discourse around education today is about how we should be directing the learning of young people. What's the best way to get kids to reach the goals that we set for them? And there's very little talk about whether we adults should be forcibly setting those goals in the first place. We still have a kind of like a mindset that if you don't like yell at your kid or you don't force them or like, you know, like manipulate them into like doing something, or incentivizing like, them with grades incentivizing with the grades or like yeah with rewards or candy or whatever it is then they're not going to grow up to being a fully functional or like good human being and i just I know, I know in my body and my bones that that is not true this opens up a ton of interesting questions yeah and that's what we get we get questions all the time you know i don't know why but it's just something about americans i guess um, I don't know if it happens anywhere else in the world, but you know, it's the biggest thing is what grade are you in? Yes. And I don't know, I'm not quite sure where, I've never asked the question to any other person because I'm just <laughs> not of that mindset, but I don't know if they truly know what they're even asking. So like if they're like, what grade are you in? And if I say 12th, what does that communicate to them? Unless, you know, I guess maybe if they're a school teacher or something, like, you know, if I said I was in first grade, you're gonna be like, you know, <laughs> you're gonna be like, oh, you're stupid? Or I don't know, I'm not quite sure. Like, is that how you judge how smart somebody is by the grade and age right. of them? Yes. So normally if somebody says, what, what's your grade? I'm like, I'm homeschooled. I'm like, or, you know, I don't, I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is kind of um, funny, that construct. And yeah. I met a family really early on in our homeschooling journey, and she was very much of this unschooling philosophy. They were excellent parents, and they actually left their house and went up to upstate New York to start a farm and homestead, and it just fits with their philosophy and their life. And there does seem to be these certain people and personality traits that really mesh well with this um, philosophy. And we are definitely one family that does, um, but um, it's being engaged in every moment of the day and, and letting go of all of the all of the rigid, the rigidity of the the confines that society puts on you, these constructs, this pressure that you have to achieve all of these certain things within the course of a day to have a successful day, or to feel like you got everything accomplished that you should yeah. have got accomplished that day. Um, it's a really a resetting of your mind to to just um, come out of that. And, and like I said, this, this whole construct of a school system is a very new construct. Mm -hmm. This is not something that has been around for um, all of history and all of humanity. Um, people did learn at home. That is what people did up until very recent modern history. Did, did we have a school system and definitely a public school system? Um, so yeah, I've never given grades, I've never given tests, um, I've never given quizzes. Now, the kids do have an online math program that they do, they are the boss of it. I don't check it, um, but on that program, it does self-grade itself. Yeah. Um, so if I wanted to go on there and check it, um, I could check it and it does send emails to my husband and he looks at them every once in a while and says, oh, this kid's doing better than this kid in math or whatever, but, um, which is kind of funny, but we do not care about grades. Um, even to the point, Matt, that there was a year that you did early on in math and you totally freaked me out because we got to the end of the year and you said, I just want to do that whole year again. And yeah. I said, but why? You got an A, which is like, what is that? It doesn't even, you know, and, you, and you're like, nah, 
I just feel like that was a lot of information this year yeah. and I'd really just like to go back and just do the whole year over again and just kind of really just take another year to just let that all sink in. Yeah. You've always excelled at math. Math mm -hmm. has always been a real strong point yeah. of yours. And that just boggled my mind. I mean, I know for a lot of homeschool moms, that would just make your mind snap, right? Because especially women, I think the homeschool, the homeschool scene is very women dominated, yes. women driven, emotionally driven, um, control driven. And, um, and you say, how many times do you say, or your brothers say, the older ones say, if I was homeschooled like that, I would hate my life. Oh, I hate my life, yeah. <laughs> and I would never want to homeschool my children. I would never, I, I just wouldn't like my life in general, right? Um, so this is something that has to be suited for a particular type of family and style of family. And it's definitely a good fit for our family questions about school, about being a parent, and most of that is way outside the scope of this video, but I did ask Sierra what she thinks public schools would look like in a more ideal world. And she told me that they should basically be like public libraries, where people of all ages are welcome to use resources and make connections, offer and take classes if they want to. Libraries already exist, and many of them are already excellent institutions of learning. So this isn't too hard to imagine. But of course, the culture would have to change with it, right? It's not just a matter of being like, oh, like schools are now just like open for if you want to come or if you don't and um, totally consent based. But because I mean, we, we ourselves have school within us, right? We have our expectations of ourselves, our pressure that we put on ourselves. <laughs> just, but like the, your, I, I saw some of the videos that you have on TikTok last night and like has school fucks with your brain. <laughs> like literally those things are like in our brains. Like, yeah, like we have those. So I think um, there, yeah, there's this structure. I think the, the many things could structurally be changed for the better in public school systems. And I don't think it would be enough without, you know, also a cultural change. So all these ideas, all this unschooling philosophy, it might be interesting to think about, but it's not worth much if it doesn't actually work, right? So can unschooling actually prepare someone for adult life? Can you find work as an unschooler? It might surprise you to hear that Sierra technically got a high school diploma and so was able to go to university. I did get a high school diploma because I wanted to try out university. So I went to like a local high school counselor and kind of did like an interview with him and he was kind enough to translate sort of my life experiences and the curriculum that I had done into like a formal high school transcript so I could go into university. And so I did go to university for one year and then uh, walked out from there also. And yeah, I was glad for the experience, um, wasn't for me. You say university wasn't for you. Some people might think you tried university and you weren't prepared for it and it was just awful experience. You were not ready to do any of the work. Is that true? That's a great question. And when I say it wasn't for me, it wasn't for me at the time. I'll just say a little bit about my experience in university. It was really interesting. For the first time in a long time, I was, I like sat down in a class and there was a professor who was telling me what I needed to learn to pass the test or whatever it was. And I was able to sit down with my notebook, take notes, absorb the information, and then go and pass the test. It was not like a complicated thing. Um, so that was, that was like the easy part of the experience, almost luxurious because I didn't have to like seek out the information on my own, <laughs> but yeah, this, it was, it was similar stuff that made me feel like it wasn't for me as, as how I felt when I was leaving elementary school. It was just kind of like the behemoth nature of like this bureaucratic like system sort of entrenched in its own mechanisms. You know, I had big class sizes. It was very impersonal. You know, it was like, it was a school of like probably 30,000 people. And so, yeah, I just, I felt like I was like a cog or like a number. If I, there, there comes a day where I really, really want to learn a thing, that I can only access through higher, like formal higher education, then I'm absolutely gonna do that. Like, I'm, I'm not against it. I think there's huge value in it for if that's what you want and that's what you need in your life. But I, where I was at that time, you know, I had other things to do and it was just, it wasn't serving me really. In, in yeah, and that's, that's why I've told people too, you know, they're like, oh, well, are you gonna go to college and do all that type of stuff? And I told them, 
No, unless if I, you know, unless my life kind of changes and I feel led to become a vet, become a veterinarian or a doctor. But other than those two things, which I don't think are going to happen, something like that that requires higher education that you can't just learn from normal day-to-day -day life skills, um, then I absolutely um, would do that. For right now, how my life's been panning out and everything like that, I definitely don't think that is going to be the career for me. And the other plus to not going down that road is you don't have a big pile of debt that you have to work on paying off your first couple years of your job that you um, learned all the skills to do. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, I can just say, I love this girl's self-confidence. I love her enthusiasm over life. I love how well-spoken she is. And I, I just go back to that family that I was telling you about early on that I met. And she just said that she, she they had a large family and she said, I let my kids learn whatever they want to learn. Whatever they are passionate about, that is what they learn, and I am just here to encourage that. So she said, it's about creating an environment and, and giving your kids all of these resources, putting these things out there, and creating this learning environment, this library-like environment, if you will, um, and letting them pursue that naturally. And you're just sitting back as the parent and you're engaged, but you are letting them take the lead. Yeah. And when you see them pursue something or find an interest in something, you're just helping them in on, along that path and, and just giving them all of the tools that they need to be successful with that and to pursue that for as long as that path leads. And it doesn't matter what the interest is as long as it glorifies the Lord. Um, it doesn't matter what that interest is because that interest might not be the end point. That interest might only get them for, from here to maybe the next six months or maybe for the next two years, but you don't know where that end point is going to be. Yep. And honestly, we don't have an end point until we're dead. So <laughs> my husband is um, a great example of that. He has changed professions um, so many times in his life. And every time the Lord has give him, given him the knowledge and skills that he needs to um, navigate that new environment and to be really successful in it. So I think a big thing about this girl and that we have in common with our family, although it doesn't need to be, um, is that I think she was raised in the Yukon and she was given a lot of freedom. Um, and obviously we are in the country and our kids have a lot of freedom. So they're learning um, things just by nature, just by being engaged. If you were in a more synthetic environment yeah. where you were in a neighborhood um, and life was not so free outside, you would have to be a lot more purposeful. It is not impossible. I can 100% tell you it is not impos impossible to unschool in a, a neighborhood environment. It is much harder but it is not impossible. And you, it would just take more effort for the parents in that you would have to um, go to the parks, um, plan the vacations, plan the camping trips, or and we don't camp, we're not a camping family, but, but plan things for your kids, plan out the activities, the engagements, do the things with them. And, and you would be helping to navigate that more than a than a specifically child-led or child-directed life. And I know even when we lived back up north, there was another family that we met with every week for a play date. And the play date was just free play for the kids. And the moms just sat around and drank coffee and got to chat. And um, that family um, there, they did an unschooling approach with their girls. And she just said, basically, um, she just, um, 
like took pictures and videos of all of the different things that they were learning and um, if there was like doctor's appointments or things they were doing during the week the kids would always come along and she would um, tell the girls ask the doctors any questions that you want look at all the charts and the things and let's take pictures of all these things and let's go to this museum and let's go um, learn about this you know whatever um, like biology club or whatever it is it really is limitless and I love that she um, did take control of her her learning and she did all different things she talks about correspondence learning you've done a little bit of that you've done a little bit of online learning yeah. you still do some online learning with your math um, and then in the past year or so we found the good and the beautiful mm -hmm. curriculum and I I'm a big proponent of it to be used as a tool yeah. not to be used as a torture mechanism um, but only to be used as a tool yes. in aiding the learning of True. whatever is delight driven. And, and some things, you know, like nouns and pronouns and adjectives might not necessarily be delight driven, but when you get to a certain age, you have a desire or your parents can, can um, encourage you in this, that this is a life skill that you are gonna to need to be successful in life. So even though this might not be your passion right now, this is something that you are gonna need yep. in order to be a successful, like a successful person in life to make it more easily, mm -hmm. easy to navigate life um, if you can write very, very well or write fluently and things like that. And all of a sudden the spark comes on and you have all the motivation in the world and they soar through the information. Whereas at a first grade, first grade level, <laughs> at, as a six year old, I'll just say, or seven or eight or nine or 10 or 11, 12, 13 years old, they might have really like been like, ugh. But then once they turn 17 years old, yeah. they're like, give it to me, I'm ready, yeah. you know? And they're ready to move on with life and they just, they, it's all the difference in the world. Yeah. So despite being able to get into university as an unschooler and being able to keep up with the academic demands, Sierra decided not to get a college degree. So at this point, you might have the same question that a member of my audience asked in a comment. I'm gonna read this the way this is was phrased by the person who asked it, but feel free to interpret it however it makes sense. Okay. Did you have trouble starting out in the professional world? <clears throat> Did I have trouble starting out in the professional world? Uh, to think about how I'll approach that one. Um, I, I'm not sure what the professional world is. <laughs> yeah, um, if if I were to try to guess where, where this person was coming from, it's the big the big story that you got to go to school, get your di diploma, get your degrees, so that you can get a good job. And there's this, you know, if if you don't have those diplomas or degrees, then how can you get a good job? Yeah. So I feel I've always felt sort of pretty strongly about like getting the job is not the goal. Getting a job is not the goal. Kind of one of my core values is is as probably you could tell like is is freedom and like being able to do what I want when I want. Um. So the idea of actually like having a job and having an employer that tells me where to what to do when and having to show up at a job every morning and like set an alarm every morning, like just sounds horrible to me. Like I just, I, I've tried pretty much to avoid that my entire life. I've definitely leaned towards like entre entrepreneurial pursuits when it comes to actually making money because you do actually need money to, to, to live, unfortunately, <laughs> um, or at least some. I've, so, so like two things, one thing that I've really focused on is, yeah, finding creative ways of of like starting my own businesses. So there's that. And then the other piece that I've really, really focused on is is not how can I make more money, but how can I spend less money and still have a comfortable life and, and do what I want. Really kind of rejecting the idea of consumption as a way to happiness. I think it's really destructive, not only for ourselves, but also for the planet. So that's kind of been my game. I enjoy the game. I understand that it's not for everyone, <laughs> um, but I, I really love it. I've never felt like, oh, oh no, I have to like go get a job because I like I'm running I'm running out of money. Um, so I try not to get myself to that point because, like I said, like I really value my freedom, and I know like it's not equal for everyone. I I have you know many opportunities other people don't have. One is that I don't live in a city. 
Um, so that makes it actually a lot easier. Okay, so let's take that uh, professional world question and sort of flip it. Okay. Uh, has unschooling made it easier for you to build a life for yourself without having to rely on the professional world? I would say so, yeah. Yeah, because I was unschooled, because I didn't go to school, I actually started, I started my own business and like a partnership in, in business with my parents when I was 11. And so that sort of practice, I mean, that opportunity, not even practice, that opportunity to actually be like a full equal partner as an adult would be in an actual legitimate business since I was 11. You know, I've been learning how to interact with customers, how to deal with marketing, how to make sure you have a quality product so your customers come back and how to like work in partnership with other people in a business and like like so many things that because I didn't go to school, I had the opportunity of learning those things from when I was quite young. Yeah, I certainly can't think of any typical school class that would teach anyone those things. <laughs> no, and the cool thing is what it was that I didn't have to get like taught it, right? I, as a, as a young person, it was just what I was doing and I was contributing to my family. Like I was a part of my family's business and contributing to a, like our, our like collective well-being. You know, I felt like a respected member of that, of that collective. Um, and so the learning was, was sort of a byproduct, right? Sounds like being a small business partner as a preteen would be useful experience for anyone who wants to make a living without relying on an employer. Now, I know there's more to being prepared for adulthood than knowing how to make money, but before we drop this topic, let's get specific. What sorts of things does Sierra do for work? Like consulting work and like odd kind of on the side, you know, making websites for people and finding like whatever it is like that's coming up in my world and my friends or my community that like they need help with and kind of like finding ways to help out with that and then sometimes getting paid for it. It's a complex mixture. Um, current, like right, right now, what I'm doing for work, what I'm getting up and doing every day is um, I'm building a really cool uh, little wooden um, like small house in the woods. You're the second unschooler I've talked to who is building their own house. So I don't know what that says. I don't know how many. <laughs> yeah, it's just something about home. Well, at least unschoolers that something about building their own house is very uh, intriguing, I guess. Same here. Planning on building my own house very soon. Well, you've already built a tiny house, right? Yes. A few years ago. And, and in doing that, how many skills did you learn? Dozens. Yes, in building that. And yeah. I think there is a, a really, um, just a boost in self-reliance yeah. and in knowledge and know-how and skill, life skills, um, and, and being able to seek out information and talk to other people. And I mean, as you were building that tiny house, the relationships that you formed with yeah. The people at Home Depot and um, the hardware store yeah. and 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 just talking to a lot of these older people and and getting their opinions on how do you run yeah. drainage pipes and how do you do this and what's your thoughts on insulation yeah. and all, I mean just all of the different things. Yeah, and our our dad wasn't in there like micromanaging or like there perpetually. Mm -hmm. I mean, we might have asked him once or twice. To look at something to look at something or like hey look what we did today um but he wasn't there like either funding the thing mm -hmm. or um, managing how things were run mm -hmm. or anything like that yeah. we made all the money from other odd jobs um just to go ahead and say uh, that little tiny house took all of us boys working full-time jobs and um now mom and dad did buy the shell for us so that was a blessing and that was a re it got repoed like three times. Yes. So, and this was before the crazy kooky uh, <laughs> coronavirus and everything. So this was back in normal or whatever. So it was very normal prices. Yes. So um, that was a blessing, but they gave us the shell. Nothing was inside of it. Mm -hmm. um, it was about 105 degrees and we were so excited. We went and slept in it that for the first, first night. night. No AC, 105 degrees. We didn't care. Um, we were just, we excited. were just super excited. Yes, and, and it's uh, beautiful. And it's a beautiful little tiny house. Yeah. It served you really, really well. Yep. And um, it doubles as a business office yep. too because you have a lot of supplies out there and things for your business. So yeah, really. And awesome. we just designed it. We we all of us boys. We um, if 
for like the flooring. Mm -hmm. We have really, really nice flooring out there because we wanted something. We didn't want any fake looking flooring. So uh, us boys, we priced, we uh, shopped for months looking for a certain type of flooring. So we got this life proof flooring that it's all super cool and all aged and everything like that. And we painted it all. We spray foamed it all. We uh, had to build walls in it and build our own bathroom and our own um, own bedroom and now own you did, kitchen. You did have an electrician come out and, yes. and show you how to run the electrical yes. and then come back out and inspect it for you yes. afterwards to make sure that everything was good yes. and we weren't going to burn it down. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yes, but you were able to, you're free to make your own choices with yep. it and make your own mistakes. Mm -hmm. And you learned how to use a program online to yeah, sketch up, sketch up, to lay it all out yep. and make changes and all of that kind of stuff. It's really, really exciting to, um, to for us as parents to sit back and, and watch you all do that was mm -hmm. a really cool thing. Um, and there's been so many adults in our lives, uh, me and my husband, that we can look back on and say, oh wow, yeah, their parents let them stop going to school. Um, my, my husband's sister actually stopped going to school and she was just really, really smart and she felt like school was a waste of her time and she just dropped out and went home and studied started college and started taking college classes and um, graduated um, with her um, occupational therapy degree really, really early. There's so many people that I know of, even on YouTube and everything, that have dropped out of school mm -hmm. and are crazy, crazy successful. Yes, absolutely. Like, crazy successful. Absolutely. And there's been several other adults in our lives too over the years that have done so many different things. A lot of them are entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. business owners, um, and it's just amazing. Yep. How many, how <laughs> common that is for people who don't unschool to build their own house, but. That's cool. You know, I didn't ask Sierra how she's monetizing that house construction project or whether she's monetizing it at all. At that point in the conversation, I was getting more interested in the non-monetary questions, especially since she told me that some of her work involves bringing the unschooling philosophy to others. I would call it more of like a passion than a career. So envision like instead of a school, like, one, like one thing that I keep hearing from young people in my life is that they hate school, but they love school because of the friends, right? They want to spend time with their friends. That's what they want to go to school for. But then all the other stuff that they have to do at school, they hate. So, so envision um, like a few, like a, fa a few families coming together, all with sort of the same idea of like not wanting to go back to school, but wanting to create this really awesome learning environment where people can have friends, can do stuff with their friends, do the things that they want, actually want to do with their friends all day long, as much as they want. So there's more and more people around the world that are doing this, smaller groups of people learning together in really awesome, fun and joyful ways. So that's part of what I do is supporting people in that process. Partly it's like telling my own story, like, you know, it's possible to do it. Your kids aren't going to like be ruined. Um, and um, I'm also a, f a learning facilitator, um, self-directed education facilitator. Um, so I've worked in a, some, some of these these like micro schools or learning centers. The kinds of micro schools and learning centers that Sierra is talking about are similar to unschooling in that they all exist under the umbrella of self-directed education, which is to say they share the philosophy that learners of all ages should be free to take charge of their own learning. There's actually a whole world of micro schools and democratic schools and learning centers that's worth exploring, but I'll save that for another video. Now, I know for some of you, your gut reaction is that maybe these alternative schools might be a scam, and maybe Sierra is only making them sound good for the sake of her own financial interest. And that is a healthy dose of skepticism. I will say that in the hour I spent talking to Sierra, I didn't get the sense that she was trying to sell snake oil. In fact, she brought up her own negative experiences with unschooling without me even having to ask. I'm not going to say it's easy to choose something different, especially given, yeah, given the world we live in and the expectations of, of like, you want to make your family proud. You know, like that's, that's totally normal and natural. A majority of my family is sort of very academically oriented. You know, there's a lot of like PhDs, a lot of like people who have really pursued like higher education and gone through with it. And that's great. I admire that. And also, 
you know, it's made it sort of a little extra difficult for me to choose a different path and not feel like I've got some people kind of giving me the side eye, you know? <laughs> Sounds like to be an unschooler, you have to be willing and able to withstand the scrutiny that comes with going against the social norm of going to school. And in that sense, it's not for everyone. There are people who just don't want to go against the norm and others who may lack the support to be able to do so. I think a huge part of it is like no one learns in isolation, right? And that's one other common misconception is like unschooling or self-directed education or homeschooling. It's like you in a room by yourself learning a thing by yourself. Like, no, people don't learn in isolation. People learn through relationships. People learn in community. People learn from their environment. And uh, I think it would be very, very challenging for someone to have a really rich and nourishing learning experience unless they have at least some, some support from parents, guardians, community members, family, someone in their life who can accompany them in that journey and give them the space to do it. And that's something I want to emphasize too. One of the criticisms I've heard is that unschooling is this callous form of rugged individualism where kids are just removed from school and left to fend for themselves. But after talking to Sierra, I think the opposite is true. Maybe school is what's callous and overly individualistic, because a student's top priority, in theory, is their own grade, part of what often feels like a zero-sum competition over who gets the best future. Whereas unschooling involves immersing young people in their communities, preparing kids for adult life by allowing them close proximity to adult life, supporting them as they make decisions and take risks in the real world. And as much as Sierra values her own freedom and autonomy, I didn't get the sense that prioritizing those individualist values in her education made her especially self-centered. Listen to how she responded when I asked her about her own happiness. How happy are you and would you change anything? Like right now in my life. <laughs> um, so I'm pretty happy. I mean, I have, I have down days like everyone else, but um, I've, I have like such a blessed and incredible life. Sometimes, yeah, it's like the, the moments where I feel like not, it's not like a bad like depression or like anything like that, but some the days where I feel like I feel sad and I feel down, which I think is actually really appropriate <laughs> in the times we're living in to feel these things. You know, some of that has to do with, you know, what is my responsibility with like the incredible life and privilege that I do have and the freedom that I have really. Um, and, and knowing that how much suffering there is out there and how much, how much work there is to do in the world to make the world a better place. Um, sometimes I, yeah, I, I, I definitely feel responsibility and, and, you know, it comes from a place of feeling like incredibly lucky and blessed and appreciative for what I do have. Speaking of that sense of responsibility, Sierra is also a co-founder of Education in Transformation, or EDIT, an initiative creating media broadly centered around self-directed education. They've got a YouTube channel, a bilingual podcast, blog posts. Some of Sierra's more recent videos highlight stories I was previously unaware of, from democratic learning communities in Egypt to children in an overcrowded refugee camp in Greece. If you want to learn more about the broader worldwide movement of self-directed education, definitely check out Edit's YouTube channel. I'll put a link in the description. And if you're interested in unschooling specifically, do you have any advice for students or parents who might be thinking about unschooling? Yeah, lots of it. Um, but the, the number one thing is, I think, um, trust yourself and trust each other. If you just really go for it <laughs> and you really sort of honor yourself and your own needs and like feel into what feels right and what doesn't feel right and be willing to be flexible and adaptable with that with yourself and the people around you you can't really go wrong. And I think that's a good note to end on. If you've made it this far in the video, thank you for sticking with me. This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to self-directed education. This video is part of a series where I interview grown unschoolers to see how their radical approach to education has worked out for them. And there's more of that to come, so keep an eye on this channel over the coming months if that's something you wanna see more of. I wanna thank Sierra for taking the time to talk to me, and special thanks to Maya Landers, the creator of grownunschoolers.com, the website where I found Sierra. You can read more about Sierra and a bunch of other grown unschoolers at grownunschoolers.com. Thank you for watching. So there's that. There's the interview. It was quite extensive, but I think it was very well put together and very well done. And now, right there at the end, too, 
Um, you definitely have to trust in the Lord and trust in yourself as well um, that you're not going to turn out to be a uh, blundering idiot if you um, don't do school or whatever. Um, and, you know, you have to have confidence. You do have to have confidence in yourself uh, for the parents, too, um, that have children. I've heard so many times over the years, oh, well, I'm not smart enough to raise my child or educate my child or, you know, all those silly things like that. Mm -hmm. um, no, the Lord gives you um, knowledge and wisdom to educate your kids hence why he gave them to you. Right. Um, so he's not going to give you something that you can't handle. No. So. And maybe your personality and, and maybe we're making this video for you today. Maybe you're struggling yeah. with your homeschool and maybe you're feeling all of the pressure that our society puts on a homeschooling mom yeah. or a homeschooling family to have the right curriculum and the right atmosphere and the right um, homeschool room and homeschool design and all of the things and all of the electives and all of the sports and all of the stuff and maybe you're feeling just crushed by all of the pressure of that and if that's you we've been there and and you can opt out of whatever yeah. you need to opt out of and embrace that freedom to just enjoy your children and give them an enjoyable home education experience no matter what that looks like it's okay um, and encourage them in in good healthy natural pur pursuits not not just lounging in front of the tv no. or spending all day playing a video game no. or being in a synthetic world yes. um, but actually encourage them in good healthy mm -hmm. things that are um, delight driven interest driven um, letting them uh, go to the library, learn things, go to different groups, make friends, make friends with your family, make friends in your neighborhood. Yep. You don't have to have friends that are the same no. age as you. Nope. Um, a lot of these constructs and confines we've just put on ourselves and even in some homeschooling groups, they're just recreating a school system environment yep. and it's not Again, um, it's not a good fit for everybody. And if no. it's not a good fit for you and for your family or even just for your children, maybe it is a good fit for you. And maybe you're finding out really quickly that it you you did good in it, but <laughs> your children are not doing good yep. in it. And you have to switch gears and change. And that's okay. That's that is totally okay. It's all about giving them the opportunities in life to pursue what they want to pursue and exactly. encouraging them in those opportunities so that they can flourish and succeed. And um, you can just sit back and, and watch that. And it's just, it's amazing to see that. And that's why I believe that everybody can homeschool. Everybody can self-educate. I don't think that there's um, anybody who can't um, I believe there's a lot of people who can't do it the way that we've defined it. Exactly. Um, in America today and in first world countries today, that is really tough and it's strenuous and it's crazy. Um, but, but when you take all of those candy wrappers off of everything, um, you, can, you can do it. You mm -hmm. can absolutely, you're already doing it. You're living life. So all you're doing is living life and bringing your child along into that life. and. And, and they take off and they have their own life and you're just there to help. It's just, it's amazing. Yep. So thank you all so much for watching today's video. Hopefully we, hopefully we inspired one person out there to either unschool or homeschool or just even if you're homeschooling and maybe you just feel like you're in a rut or um, you're just kind of feeling down. Uh, hopefully this encourages you to keep on keeping on. And anyway, we will catch y'all on the next video. See y'all later. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.